This is a call to action and awareness. It really is past time for us to set the captives free. The realities of modern day slavery are really an atrocity that we have to address. I'm Tama Bryant Davis, president of the Society for the Psychology of Women, and we felt it was so important to raise awareness about the mental health components and effects of modern day human trafficking and slavery. And so that's what we attempt to do during this series. You're going to hear from psychologists, hear from survivors, and then hear what you can do to make a difference. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, and after drug dealing, human trafficking is the second largest illegal industry or criminal industry in the world, and it's growing rapidly on a yearly basis. This is happening in our backyards. This is happening in suburbia. This is happening in San Diego, where I'm from in DC. This is happening all over this country right here. This is happening at an alarming rate. I spent so much time medicating myself and holding on to my pain that I could step out of it and just do what you're supposed to do. I was still fighting. My adopted daughter, I adopted her when she was two years way back in Uganda. And when I left Uganda for the United States. I left her in the care of my sister, my young sister. After some years, my sister passed away. And this child had nowhere to go. So she stayed with friends. And that's where she met the person who, who brought her here, promising that she was going to show her to me. Trafficking is about somebody approaching you and telling you, I'm here to help you. I'm here to offer you something good. And it turns out that the reality becomes something very different. They promised her that they were going to show her to me, that they were going to put her in school, and they were going to give her a better life. And she believed them. So when she reached the United States, she was put under house arrest. She was told not to speak on the phone. She was told not to talk to anybody. She was told that they don't know me and they don't know where I am. Well, basically human trafficking involves three major elements that there is force, fraud, and coercion to get somebody involved in being a trafficked person. I mean, they're affected at psychological, behavioral, medical, physical. It is just devastating. You know, the price is steep for the effects that happen to them. Trafficking has nothing to do with transportation. No legal definition includes the word transportation. This is a common misunderstanding about trafficking. It has to do, um, as Nancy said, force, fraud, and coercion. That's the legal definition. I want us psychologists to develop our own language. It has to do with control, coercion, and exploitation. Third-party control. You have a buyer and a seller. Most of the research has been done on victims, but there's a buyer and a seller who are equal parties to the crime. I was molested at five years old. I wasn't taught about 
my body. I wasn't taught about sex. When I was five, the Caucasian guy would pick me up and he would give me 50 cents, a dollar. My mind was conditioned as a young child to, to you know, you have sex, the sex is associated with money. Those were two things that led to my life of prostitution and then the sex trafficking. Oh. If there's one place where everything bad that can possibly happen to women happens, it's in trafficking for prostitution. Domestic violence, sexual violence, racism as an integral part of everything, poverty made worse, discrimination, organized crime jumps into the mix. It's just, it's just where if you can think of something, some way to hurt women, that's where it, it's all happening. There's a complexity to addressing the harm of trafficking for prostitution. And that complexity is a result of the fact that we're talking about domestic violence, we're talking about sexual violence, racist violence, poverty, childhood trauma and neglect, and we're also talking about organized crime. And this is what few people are talking about yet, but it's critical to get there governmental and community complicity with the crime of trafficking. Sex trafficking is the global form of prostitution. People in prostitution, people who have been trafficked, describe it in these words, volunteer slavery and the choice that's not a choice. And in those words, you can see the appearance and the reality of what we're talking about. A woman in a legal Nevada brothel, legal prostitution said, no one really enjoys getting sold. It's like you sign a contract to be raped. This guy, just as, I mean, a beautiful black man, <laughs> dressed really, really nice. And he'd come up to the school and see me and talk with me and, you know, just made me feel like I was just so special, what I did not receive at home. And so he asked me to go to a motel room with him. So I go to the motel with R.C. That's what I'll call him. And as soon as I got in the room and he had me take off my clothes, he took a wire clothes hanger and he hit me and he hit me and I couldn't feel it anymore. And he was hitting and I couldn't feel it and I couldn't feel it, and I couldn't feel it, and he just kept hitting. And then he told me that I had to go out on the street. He told me what I had to do. He told me how much money I had to ask the person for. And I just remember I didn't have any more feelings. I didn't have any more feelings. I didn't feel anything, nothing. I mean, they're affected at psychological, behavioral, medical, physical. It is just devastating. You know, the price is steep for the effects that happen to them. To me, what's most salient and what's most interesting and challenging is how much people's ability to trust is affected. And that just poses a series of complications clinically. I've sat with people who really don't trust me at all. It, it takes being interested in, in being with people where they're at. And the, the providers that we work with, I, I would say that's probably their biggest challenge too. I'm the founder and executive director of PAVE. It's Promoting Awareness, Victim Empowerment. I founded PAVE to use art, education, and grassroots action to shatter the silence of sexual and domestic violence. This is a huge problem and the silence that surrounds these issues allows this public health crisis to continue. So here's where it gets a little tough. We're gonna to share some, some real life stories and I share these with you to really give face. PAVE as an organization believes in the power of using survivor stories. 
Now the consumers of this, and this is one thing that I can't drive home enough, the consumers were high profile community members, various law enforcement, dean of students, well known businessmen in the community consuming people, children. And they became a slave in their own home and both think that their mothers knew about what was going on. Amanda, it started when I was really young. I didn't know what was happening. All I know was that it hurt. My dad would bring me to the basement. It was more of a torture chamber. He tied me up and literally whipped me. Him and his law enforcement friends would use me. He loved to let other men and women do the same. And he forced me to watch him do these things to other girls. He loved the pain more than anything. Stacy, my stepfather began to sexually abuse me when I was five years old. He moved us into a multi-million dollar home, but he put my room in the basement. The first time he sexually abused me, he had to cut me in order to penetrate me. That same night, his doctor friend came over and I heard the words that I will never forget as long as I live. The doctor said, this is how you do it without doing too much damage. The doctor then proceeded to rape me as well. The younger a child, the more money that men will pay. At the end of the day, my stepfather would always tell me that I had to make more money the next day if I ever wanted to see my mother again. Again, fear. I was trapped, literally trapped in this basement room. Day after day, men would come in and have sex with me however they wanted. Most of them were sadistic in nature, and all they cared about was seeing how much pain they could cause. Now, there's a lot of victim blame that goes on, Stacy, in terms of self-blame. I really thought because I was 21 that it didn't matter because I had let this happen, even when she was older. Again, this abuse lasted her entire life. In the family blame, Amanda, the only reason I was born was so that my father could have sex with me. That's what my mom always told me. My mother hated me because he had sex with me more than he had sex with her. She knew the entire time what was going on. Now there's so much emotional aftermath. It wasn't just these horrific experiences that these young women dealt with, but the emotional aftermath is something that we all need to be aware of. Eating disorders, you want that control over your body that you didn't have during the abuse. So a lot of survivors starve themselves or overeat. A lot of the self-mutilation cutting. And there's a lot of depression, suicidal thoughts and tendencies, alcohol and drug abuse, hypo versus hyposexualization. PTSD and trust issues with multiple victimizations. You know, the pain from those childhood experiences, um, they affected me, you know, so badly in my adult life. Um, I would, oh God, I wish you could hurry up in a relationship. You know, oh, just get up off of me. I couldn't stand away, you know, my uh, kid's father. I couldn't even stand away, they smelt. You know, I didn't, but I didn't express it. I got up, I fought. Um, I, you know, wasn't able to uh, hold jobs. I was just so unstable mentally, you know, because of all the abuse. Just being hugged by anybody, I didn't feel anything. And to say, I love you, I said it because I was supposed to say it, not because I felt it. It's crucial that we pay attention to the risk factors, those things that really make people vulnerable to modern day slavery and trafficking. One of the key components is income. When people are living in poverty, then they're much more at risk for being enslaved. Not only poverty on the individual level, but when we look at countries that are in poverty. In developing countries, there's much more of a risk of being enslaved and being trafficked within those borders and outside of those borders. One of the things that goes along with income is education. Education, we know, is really an entryway for opportunity. And when you don't have a lot of opportunities for yourself within your community, within your family, then you're much more open to believing the stories that people tell you that they can help to give you a better life, or they can help to give you a job opportunity, or believing that someone is gonna marry you when really their intention is to traffic you. How does a girl get trafficked in Nepal? Well, sometimes it's through a, a promise of marriage. So a young man will come to the village and he'll say, my family's not from around here, we're from the south, but we're a very respectful family. 
I'd like to marry your daughter and the parents, not having any better prospects, having too many mouths to feed, choose to believe him. And he takes her over the border and sells her. He's a broker. Another way that it happens is sometimes by kidnapping, especially when a girl has been displaced or is trying to emigrate. Once she's outside the protection of her natal family, she's very much at risk. But by far the most common mode of trafficking, which we and other researchers have found, is the promise of jobs. So uh, an attractive, well-dressed woman or man will come to the village and will say, I uh, can get your daughter's jobs in India. I can get them good jobs in hotels. They'll start out in the kitchen, they'll work up, they'll be maids, they can send money home. You can get that new roof for your house. And families let their daughters go. And these people are brokers. As soon as they cross the border, they sell the girl to a brothel. So we have to pay attention to income, to education, and also knowing that young people are the most vulnerable. Children are very vulnerable to traffickers. They can get a lot more years out of them when they traffic them when they're very young. Estimates range from 70 to 90 percent of these kids have experienced some kind of abuse at home. Kids who are runaways, who are homeless, kids who've been in and out of foster care, who are in residential treatment programs, are much more at risk. And so we're taking a, a group of youth who are already vulnerable, and then they're experiencing yet another trauma. Placing low-income individuals and vulnerable families at heightened risk and danger. In terms of race disparities, you should know that in terms of price, it is more expensive to purchase a white woman, it's less expensive to purchase an Asian than Latina woman, and then the cheapest women and girls to purchase are black women. And that is not only locally, but globally, in terms of buying slaves in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, and here in the United States. And so there is racism within the experience of human trafficking. Another vulnerable population when it comes to trafficking are those who have been victimized or traumatized in the past, whether these are survivors of childhood abuse, childhood sexual or physical abuse, oftentimes those who are homeless and runaways are very vulnerable, and also when we're thinking about trafficking from a global perspective, those who have experienced war, who are displaced, living in refugee camps, separated from family, from friends, from their resources, sometimes out of context where they don't even know the language, they don't know the resources that are available, and so they're very much dependent on those who pretend to be resources, those who pretend they're going to help them. And it's unfortunately because when we talk about the least of these, that really those who have already been traumatized are the ones that predators often go after. Lastly, I want to mention the issue of gender. While men are more likely to be trafficked when it comes to manual labor, when it comes to sex trafficking, girls and women are particularly vulnerable to being victimized, and we must respond to those factors. I was sitting at a park on Century and Western, and I thought about the rapists. I thought about the 11 times I was raped. I thought about how I got hit in the back of the head with the brake shoe and all the miscarriages that I had and hit in the face with the gun and a nail going through my forehead and, and just all the walking until my feet busted open, staying up six days to two weeks smoking crack and drinking 15 bottles of liquor a day, two packs of cigarettes. I thought about my babies. I thought about it and I said, I spent so much time fighting the system I spent so much time medicating myself and holding on to my pain because I still held on to that pain. I spent so much time holding on to that that I couldn't see. Step out of it and just do what you're supposed to do. And your children will be returned and life will get back to normal and you'll be okay and continue in your therapy and continue praying to your higher power and continue the groups and, you know, but I just, I was, I was still fighting. The one thing that always sticks in, in my head 
um, when I consult with, with, with providers is how frequently they say, you know, I really want to help this population. I really want to help these women. Um, but they just don't trust me. They just don't believe that, and that, that, that I'm there to help. And something that I always try to explain to providers is, well, you know, think about this. Trafficking is about somebody approaching you and telling you, I'm here to help you. I'm here to offer you something good. And it turns out that the reality becomes something very different. People are hurt, um, they're coerced, and they're, all the promises that were made to them are, are broken by traffickers. So that's definitely going to play out in our work. Me ha ayudado porque antes estaba bien como muy muy traumada, pero ahora me ayudó porque yo estoy yendo casi um, una vez a la semana viendo con mi terapia y uno tiene que tener ánimo, uno tiene que estar como positivo. Si seguir saliendo, yo me voy a salir adelante, así siempre uno piensa en eso, en positivo. Y cuando uno quiere estar bien, es cuando tiene que uno luchar por alguien que tiene a su lado. Yo estoy luchando salir adelante en todas las cosas que yo he pasado por mis hijos, porque mis hijos me motivan. Tengo muchos sueños que tengo, quiero realizar, por eso yo no quiero quedarme allí, por que este, muchas cosas me emocionan aquí en Estados Unidos, hay muchas oportunidades y yo quiero muchas cosas que yo quiero se hacen de realidad, por eso yo, yo estoy yendo en el terapia y decir seguir adelante, me, eh, seguir adelante, nunca se pueden callar lo que uno está pasando, porque yo así yo dije, yo nunca me quedé callada porque pedí ayuda y me buscaron ayuda y ahora tengo esa ayuda que yo quiero y gracias a Dios estoy saliendo adelante y con mucha fuerza y por mis hijos también, por mi familia y por la gente de mi pueblo que yo los quiero ayudar, eso es lo más importante para mí y por eso yo estoy saliendo adelante y nada más. With relationships, me being able to trust again and opening up to a person and, and being able to, you know, go out and I want to say, okay, it's okay that this guy, he's not Jack the Ripper. He is okay if he takes me to the movies and it's so, yeah, so I want to get past the, the isolation and my trust issues and that's, that's where I am today. Dr. King said, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And trafficking is happening globally and it's happening locally. Often I hear people talk hypothetically about what they would do if they were living during the time of slavery. If they're people of African descent, they often say that I would have never been a slave and these are all of the fantastical things and the people that I would have freed. And if I'm talking to people of other ethnicities, they would say I would definitely be on the side of the abolitionists. Well, this is not a hypothetical question. Slavery is happening now. And so as psychologists and as individuals, we have to answer that response with, what is it we will do with the fact that there are slaves living amongst us? Slave victims must be looked at as vulnerable, but that has to be separated from weak and powerless. Because the problem is, even now in the modern abolition movement, in intervention and prevention efforts, people are going in and they're assuming that these victims or these, these communities that are at risk and these children that are at risk are somehow weak and powerless. It's, it's that hero complex that we have to somehow go in and save them and rescue them. When in reality, what we need to do is empower them. And a lot of the perpetrators, especially when we're talking about domestically, are very powerful. We see a lot of white collar perpetrators that are doctors and police officers and lawyers 
And it's hard for us to wrap our minds around these powerful people living right in our community, in our backyards, that are participating and that are perpetrating these horrific crimes. We must make visible what is currently invisible. Um, invisible experiences and conditions, things such as poverty and violence, if we are to succeed in our efforts to reduce disparities among women. This will require, as Nancy and Tima's presentations point out, that we are vigilant and we learn to identify signs of human trafficking and develop strategies for communicating with potential survivors. It also means, and I think all of the presenters do this, that we must work mindfully across multiple intersecting levels, thinking closely about physical health, mental health, and the consequences of systematic inequality and the impact of deep power differences. Working across multiple levels means that we must ensure that policies protect and serve women, all women. Psychologists have an important role to play in anti-trafficking work. They can both provide public education and raise awareness, which can lead to prevention of trafficking. They can do research to identify the scope of the problem. They can advocate for policy change. And they can also do direct intervention with survivors of trafficking. The very first issue we have to look at when it comes to preventing human trafficking and modern day slavery is on the side of the consumer. Many times we think about how we can warn women and warn girls what to look out for, but the truth is as long as there continues to be a demand for those who are trafficked, while there continues to be a demand for prostitution, then this will continue to happen. So we really have to interrupt the cycle early and look at those messages that teach boys and men that women are a commodity, that sexuality is something to purchase. We have to really look at the images of pornography that objectify and eroticize all women, and particularly women of color, that get presented as objects that are available for you to buy. And we have to really understand the impact of that on intimacy, to understand even in our media, in the movies, how sexuality really gets associated with violence. So you have a nude woman and then violence is done to her and that's supposed to somehow be erotic. We have to look at American culture where even the term pimp has become positive. When people talk about pimping their ride or pimping their house, that somehow that is uh, the, a beautification of something instead of recognizing the realities of what pimps do. They commit violence and atrocities. And even we have to be careful about our language. Many who have had to work in the realm of prostitution will use the term the game. How long have you been in the game? Or what was your introduction to the game? And the truth is there is nothing funny about it, nothing enjoyable about it. And so the prevention is not just working with those who are vulnerable to being trafficked, but really interrupting these messages in our society that say selling of hum the sale of human beings is okay. And we have to say, never, it's not okay for anybody anywhere. I want to do whatever I can to help at least raise the awareness of it because my sense is that at least in my field of psychology very few psychologists are really aware of it and even the larger public is less aware of it that this is an epidemic that's really a horrible uh, human rights violation. This is happening right now and not only is it happening somewhere far away from here but it's happening right here. I had to say to myself you know, I learned about Harriet Tubman. I learned about Sojourner Truth. I learned about Frederick Douglass. And we said, wow, how marvelous what they did was. What am I gonna do right now? Here I am, this uh, psychologist. I'm now the president of this organization. What can I do with what I know and the resources that I have to really make a difference? And to say that I am not amongst those who sat back and said nothing. Uh, Judith Herman, who was one of my mentors in her book, Trauma and Recovery, said, it's very easy to side with the perpetrator. All they ask us for is our silence. And that's so true. If you do nothing, then you're supporting the status quo. And so I knew that I had to say something and that I couldn't sit on the sidelines. And for me, that's from a moral perspective, not just a professional perspective, and just emotionally, 
that uh, there is a pull on my heart to do everything I can so that people can live with freedom.